A very good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to warmly welcome you all to the 129th webinar. <clears throat> of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, which is the 64th BAS webinar of the English webinar series. Today's webinar is organized by the BAS Seminar Committee. <clears throat> we thank the Seminars Committee of the BAS, chaired by Secretary BAS, Mr. Rajiv Amrasuriya, with the convener, Assistant Secretary, Mr. Pasinga Silva, and the co-conveners, Mr. Pandula Vanyaraji, Mr. Oshan Uderatna, Ms. Anne Devananda and Ms. Nikki Mapitigama. I would also take this opportunity to thank the president of the BASL, Mr. Salia Piri's President's Council, and the other members of the management committee of the BASL for all the supports and guidance. Throughout these webinars, we have seen some of the most brilliant legal minds in the country share with you their knowledge and experience, and today is no different. The topic for the discussion is the law of trust and the current Sri Lankan context. I'm delighted to warmly welcome and introduce our, introduce our distinguished panel for this evening. First and the foremost, we have with us Dr. Kanaganayagam Kanagiswaran, President's Council. Having taken Sil Silk in January 1988, he is Barrister at Law of Lincoln's Inn, a graduate in law from the University of London, and an advocate of the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka 1966. He was conferred the degree of Doctors of Laws, LLD, Honours Causa, by the University of Colombo at its convocation in 2017. Also, he has on 28 July this year completed 52 years of active practice at the Sri Lankan Bar. He has an extensive practice on civil side in both the original and appellate courts and specializes in several areas of law, including corporate, intellectual property, banking and finance, shipping and admiralty, telecommunication, IT, and international commercial arbitration. A member of the Law Commission of Sri Lanka from 1994 till 2009, he initiated the enactment and chaired the Committee of the Law Commission, which drafted the Mutual Assistance in Civil and Commercial Matters, Act Number no. 39 of 2000, and the Reciprocal Enforcement of Judgment Act, the latter still awaits enactment. He led the team of local and foreign legal experts who drafted the Arbitration Act No. 11 of 1995. He also drafted the current High Court Admiralty Jurisdiction Rules 1991 at the invitation of the then Law Commission chaired by Dr. H. W. Jayawardene QC. He was the chairman of the Advisory Commission on Intellectual Property Law, which drafted the Intellectual Property Act number 36 of 2003, making it trips compliant. He also presided the chair, as the chairman of the Advisory Commission on Company Law from 1994 to 2008, which spearheaded the drafting and enactment of the Companies Act number 7 of 2007. Since 2016, he served as the chairman of the Committee of Experts drafting the new Securities Exchange Act 2017 at the invitation of the Securities and Exchange Exchange Commission of Sri Lanka. The Bill of the Securities and Exchange Act 2017 is soon to be published in the Gazette. He is a founder director and the member of Council of Management of the Institute for the Development of Commercial Law and Practice ICALP, established in 1992 as a guarantee company, and the founder director of the ICLP Arbitration Center, which was established in 1996 with the passage of the Arbitration Act 1995. He is also a lecturer and examiner for several courses conducted by the Institute for the Development of Commercial Law and Practice, including the Diploma Course in Arbitration, the Certificate Course in Shipping Law and Practice, and short courses on the Law of Arbitration, Company Law, and Intellectual Property. He was a visiting lecturer at the Sri Lanka Law College and is a visiting lecturer at the Faculty of Law, University of Colombo, currently lecturing on advanced company law and arbitration for the LLM course of the Faculty of Law, University of Colombo. He also serves as moderator and supervisor at Faculty of Law, University of Colombo and the Department of Law, University of Peradeniya. A member of the Faculty of 
faculty board of the faculty of law university of colombo from 1990 he also served as a member of the council of the university of colombo from 2005 to 2016 he is also a member of the board of trustees of the national trust sri lanka and its current president he also the chairman of the board of trustees of all ceylon hindu congress he holds several other positions of responsibility in advisory and other capacities in public and private bodies he has written extensively lectured and presented papers both locally and abroad in professional social religious and other public fora on several subject touching in his area of practice and otherwise and is the co-editor of the arbitration law in sri lanka third edition 2013 published by the ICLP and the co-author of Company Law 2014 secondly we have Mr Suresh RI Pereira is the principal tax and regulatory at KPMG in Sri Lanka and it's a is a multidisciplinary profession with over 20 years experience in taxation accounting and legal aspects mr pereira is a fellow member of the chartered institute of management accountants fcma uk and a chartered global management accountant and is a member of cima global council and the cima membership committee he also served in the cima sri lanka board for 2 years 2015 and 2016 he is a former regional board member of AICPA Middle East South Asia and North Africa during the years 2017 2018 and 2018 19 he holds a bachelor of law degree from the faculty of law university of colombo and is an attorney at law mr pereira is a member of the kpmg middle east and south asia tax steering committee he is a highly experienced tax lecturer public speaker and an author of many press articles also we have ms ruanti tantrige who is an attorney at law with over 6 10 years of practice in varying roles from in-house legal officer of a blue chip conglomerate to top tier law firm she is currently the head of legal of lion brewery ceylon plc and before her current position she headed the trust department of julis and creasy specializing in establishing private and charitable trusts drafting of last wills and administering trust in the capacity of trustee through the trustee arm of the julis and creasy jesse a uh, trust service private limited she holds a master of business administration from post graduate institute of management university of sri jayawardenepura a bachelor of laws from university of colombo and is an associate member of cima uk miss tantrike holds a certificate in capital markets from the financial service academy securities and exchange commission of sri lanka and a post attorney diploma in international trade from the council of legal education Sri Lanka Law College she has expertise in drafting a wide range of commercial contracts notarial deeds and documentation and experience in adv advising clients on the leg legalities and risk aspects of commercial transaction and our moderator for the evening ms rani labije sundara is an experienced corporate lawyer she has an llb from the university of london a masters from the university of colombo she was a senior associate at julius and creasy and And handle matters in the areas of mergers and acquisitions, corporate and commercial law, infrastructure, telecommunication, and IT. She also interned at the prestigious UN International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, located in the Netherlands, where she was part of the judges' chamber, hearing the biggest trial in the tribunal's history. Miss Vijay Sundara presently handles the in-house legal function for Capital Alliance, a leading investment bank in Sri Lanka, which has now expanded overseas to Bangladesh. And the participants, if you have any questions, please post them via Q and A box. Having said that, without further delay, I now hand over the proceedings to the moderator for the day. Over to you, Miss Ranila. Thank you, Abhirami. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, we have an eminent panel of speakers today to discuss the law of trust and the current Sri Lankan context. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty of it, let me briefly introduce you to the areas that each one will be covering. We have Dr. Kanagi Swaran, who will give an overview of the law of trust, 
And that will include the types of trusts, the role of the settlor, trustee, and beneficiary. And you will also speak about the current use. Moving on, Ms. Ruandi Santrige will explain how trust can be used as an instrument for estate planning. Following up with Mr. Suresh Pereira will guide us on the taxation of trust. He will also focus on from the standpoint of a beneficiary. Now, without further ado, I would like to hand the controls over to Dr. Kanagi Swaran. Sir, over to you. Sir, you have to unmute. Thank you. I think the host uh, unmuted me. Uh, muted me. Anyway, thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, for the uh, rather long introduction. Actually, it's a little out of date, I think. Anyway, I'm happy to be here with you to share with you something about the law. Trust is a vast area of law. It's lots of complicated twists and turns here and there, but I want to uh, share with you some, as, as, uh, as Ranila said, an overview of the whole thing. Now, trust is, a, is widely considered to be the most innovative contribution of the English legal system. So it is English law. So that doesn't mean that we still have recourse to the English statutes and English common law generally. Therefore, I must remind you that insofar as our law related to trust is concerned, it is contained in the four corners of the trust ordinance. I mentioned that because there are certain areas which vary a little bit, too much to talk about today. Uh, from the English law uh, trusts and between our laws since it was codified in uh, 1918. So um, I would first, uh, I will have to throw back to the act itself because we were taught very young when you're dealing with an act and definition in an act, you must always read the section and try to somewhat, you know, so abbreviate it, it so that it can be digested easily. So, Trust have been defined in section three of the trust ordinance as follows. As an obligation annexed to the ownership of property. That's very important. An obligation annexed to the ownership of property and arising out of a confidence reposed in and accepted by the owner. So it's an obligation annexed to the ownership of property of an owner of a property. That obligation arises out of a confidence reposed in and accepted by the owner, the owner of the property, or declared and accepted by him for the benefit of a person, of another person. So I own, the trustee owns the property for the benefit of somebody else, of another person and the owner, and of such a character. So what is the character of this obligation and to the ownership of the property is it's such a character while the ownership nominally rests in the owner of the property. If I'm the owner of the property, I declare a trust, then while the ownership nominally rests with me, the right to the beneficial interest of the payment of the property is vested in some other person or other person jointly or concurrently with the owner. So what it means is if I have a property in my ownership, I declare a trust, we'll keep to the nitty gritty of it and in favor of somebody else. Then suppose I'm the owner of a cultivated land or the fruits of the land, will on my own land is when it is collected, it's held by me to the benefit of the other person for whom I am holding it. So therein arises several um, legal positions arising from the concept of trust. So before I get to the further aspects of it, I must say a trust in the form of a definition that I have read to you now can be created only for a lawful purpose. Understand that when, when Suresh comes to talk about it, you can see it can also be put to bad uses. All things can be put to good uses and bad uses, but 
the law says it can only be created for a lawful purpose. And I must say, those of you with the Roman Dutch, Rebecca, I don't know where they start anymore. Uh, there used to be a thing called fidei commissum. That is different from the trust. And it was, of course, abolished way back in, nine, in the 70s. It's a really sad Bandar Naika, so I won't trouble you with that. Remember, we hear about PDA Commission, it's not the same thing as trust. You might sometimes find it familiar or similar to this, but it is not. This is an English concept, not a Roman Dutch concept. Right. So, what is it? What is this trust relationship by reason of the definition I have read to you? It simply means a trust is a legal relationship in which the owner of the property gives it to another person or entity who must keep and use that solely for the another's benefit. So the owner of the property gives it to somebody else and he keeps as owner for the benefit of that other person, they put simply that. So there are three parties involved, maybe two only, depending on whether the owner and trustee are the same or no. So the party who entrusts the property, which is in his ownership to somebody else, as per the definition, is called the trustee. So I declare a trust in respect of my property and I become the owner of the property, I become a trustee of the property. I don't have the full rights of ownership as to what it means, we'll come to in a moment. So remember that. So that very often, um, People declare, I am donating this to Lord Katarakam. Or I am donating this to the Sangha or something like that. Question arises, what happens there? But so it depends on what sort of law will cover it, Buddhist ecclesiastical law or the law related to Hindu temples and things like that. So remember, but the moment I declare a, a, a trust, that is, I am reposing on myself an obligation. To be here to hold the property benefit of another, a trust is created. The one who so declares who is the owner of the property is called the set law in English law. We call it the author of the trust under our act. Then the party to whom the property is entrusted for that purpose of holding it for a third party, the beneficiary, is called the trustee. So I can be the owner of the property, I also can be the trustee, but I can give the property to another person and say, come here, Mr. X, you are the trustee. I convey to you the ownership of the property. You hold that property for the benefit of the third party. So the trustee can be different from the original owner of the property or the trustee can be the original owner of the property in his new legal form of a trustee with the ownership only and beneficial interest to somebody else, the third party. Might seem a little difficult, but that's the best I can do. So the person for whose benefit a trustee holds the property is called the beneficiary. So we have the author of the trust. We have the trustee is holding the property. And other person, third person for whose benefit is holding the property, either his property or somebody else's property conveyed to him. Of course, in Roman Dutch law, title of the property must be conveyed by notarial address and instrument. So you know, going into that is the mechanics of the formalities of transferring immovable property, mobile property, that another aspect of the law. But ownership is transferred. The owner transfers the ownership to the trustee. The owner and the trustee may be the same, or the trustee may be different. So ownership is transferred to the trustee. He holds the ownership, but he can do what he wishes with it. He has to hold it for the benefit of the person, the beneficiary. Now, what he does with the property, that goes into the question of what is the trust all about? What is it for? So we have the author of the set law, the author of the trust, the trustee, the beneficiary, and the corpus, movable or immobile money or land or whatever. Corpus, it is subject to the trust, is known as the trust property. Now, these are words from the from the uh, from the ordinance and these are basic concepts you should never lose sight of you want to understand unravel something called trust now trust may be I'll, in passing i will say it may be a revocable trust or an irrevocable trust Irre irrevocable trust means you can't mess around with the 
declaration of trust you have said for all times. That means an irrevocable trust is one in which the terms of the trust cannot be amended or revised. I say, by the way, I'll get it out of the way. So when we come back to the legal relationship, what we are saying is trustee is then, remember this very, trustee is then the legal owner of the property in the trust. The trustee is the legal owner of the trust property. No matter who held it prior to that. So he becomes a trustee. He is conveyed the ownership. He is the owner of the trust property. And he holds it for the benefit of a third party, the beneficiary. And therefore, that imposition of the confidence creates a fiduciary duty upon the trustee because he is holding it for somebody else. Right? So the somebody else, the beneficiary, in whose behalf the trustee is holding, also has ownership of a sort, which in law is called an equitable ownership. So the, there is a legal ownership. On the one hand, with the trustee, he can convey the property, he can invest the money, all those things. And there's an equitable ownership. There's a kind of ownership in the beneficiary because the results of that, the mean profits in the land or the investment return from the investment or money, interest or whatever it is, belongs to the beneficiary, which is an equitable ownership of the trust property. Now, the trust ordinance has about 20 sections on the duties of liabilities of a trust. I can't go through that, but if you are the trust owner with you, you can flip through it. But fundamentally, the primary duty of a trustee is a fiduciary duty. What does it mean? You are doing these things in trust for somebody else to manage the trust to the benefit of the equitable owners. Equitable owners are the beneficiary. They can be one, several, named, or group. The poor people of Maradana can be, can be identified down Dean's Road. So it can be identified, I will say. Or a single person, a child, or your wife, or your husband, or for purposes, you're holding everything for their benefit. The uses to which the trust can be put are numerous, depending on what you want done. That will come to quickly later on. So understand, legal ownership and equitable ownership is held by the trustee and the beneficiary respectively. And by, by reason of the fact that the ownership is held by a trustee for the benefit of the others, it creates in law a fiduciary duty, which is manage the trust. Whatever the trustee does must be for the benefit of the beneficiary. He must provide regular accounting of the trust income and the expenditures. Of course, some, under the trust instrument, trustees may be reimbursed for their work, but they cannot take the produce of the trust or the investment, the returns for their personal pocket. That will be a breach of the trust. So in the section 20 section dealing with the duties and liabilities for the trustee. One principal section is section 23, breach of trust. So breach of trust involves if you breach any of the duties you are imposed on by law. There are several common law duties. In England, we have that. Here, we are governed by this section. These two 20 sections, the breach. So breach means you are obliged to do something, you do not do it. The consequences of breach, I will come to a little later. So trustees can be compensated. They may be reimbursed for the expenses, uh, so on and so forth. Now, who can be trustees? A trustee can be a natural person. A trustee can be an entity or a public body. When you say entity, it has to be a body corporate, person recognized in law because he must be able to hold property. So if it's human being, well, it'll be in their name or jointly in their name. There are several trustees. There can be one trustee, several trustees. You know? So they have to... So now I am on the question of ownership. Well, if you are going to declare a trust of your property uh, before you, as you might say, you, before you kick the bucket, you must decide there's one trustee or several trustees and you must convey your property to the trustee, several, one or several, that by 
by a notary attested instrument of transfer. So there can be several trustees. When there are several trustees, all must carry out their financial duties together. You see? So trustees, then may be a natural person, a business entity, a public body, so on and so forth. So the trust is then, how do I execute the trust as a trustee? Because traditionally, the trust instrument will have the terms of the trust. What do I might do? What am I to do? Am I going to invest this money that you give me or the land you are giving me, cultivate it, and what do I do with the produce? Do I send it to the market and realize it and pay it to the beneficiary or give them the, to the rubber, give them the latex for them to go and manufacture it or whatever? All those are set out in the trust instrument which creates the trust deed. It can be a trust deed. So that the trust trustee must hold the trust property in terms of the under the terms created by the trust deed the instrument is sort of what they call the declaration of confidence now it's possible for a single individual to assume the role of more than one of these parties which means you can i can theoretically i can hold the property this this is where certain advantages arise from the point of view of taxation and all that I can declare the property to be the trustee myself and also the beneficiary. You know, that's more complicated, but it is possible. So the multiple individual can share a single role under a law. It's called a living trust, but I don't want to take you there. Um, so the principal thing is trustee, the what, what flows with the obligation to be to protect the trust property means a trustee cannot set up title against the beneficiary to the trust property. Right? You can't, because you are in possession as against the beneficiary, you cannot claim to oust the beneficiary. We'll come to that uh, when if you are discussing prescription and things like that, I don't know. So that is one of the obligation there. While the trust is given the legal title to the trust property, in accepting the trustee, he owes a number of financial duties, as I said, to the beneficiary. The primary duties, as I said, was apart from accounting and financial duties of loyalty, prudence, impartiality, um, and they are held to a very high standard of care in their dealings to enforce uh, the trust property, and so on and so forth, right? Of course, as I said, um, it may be compensated. Now, uh, if they find that a trustee has failed in any of these uh, duties, such a failure is a civil breach of trust. Section 23 deals with it because we are given 20 odd minutes. I don't want to go into the details. I don't want to read it. 23 sec Section 23 is the one deals with that thing. Now, creation. A trust may be created by the expressed, expressed intentions of the author of the trust then it is called an express trust. Or, more importantly, it can be created by the operational law. Law says in certain circumstances, factual matrix, factual circumstances, it will imply a trust. So it's called an implied trust. Express trust, implied trust. So I am dealing with some property under certain circumstances. Then the law says, the circumstances under which you came into the ownership of the property such that you are holding it under a trust, which we imply from the circumstances under which you became the owner of the trust. That's an implied trust. Uh, this is a basically, so its implication is by the court of law because of the acts or situations of the party which resulted in court finding as an implied trust. Or you alleged, you said this happened, and therefore, the implied trust is probably a pleading that will play before court. The court will come to that finding. By operational law, if the court says, yes, it has happened, then the, uh, it becomes a re lawfully recognized implied trust. Now, the resulting, one of the things is resulting trust is an implied trust. For the law to work out on the presumed intention. So, you are implying an implied trust on the basis of facts and circumstances placed before the court, on the basis of presumed intention, that you intended this, 
when you took it from so and so as into your custody as owner, it was your precious intention was in which it was given is that you're holding it in trust for somebody else and therefore a resulting trust consideration of, of uh, intention that is expressed, uh, is implied. Then there is a constructive trust. Constructive trust again is, an, is a trust implied by law. It is to work justice between the parties, regardless of their intentions. So resulting trust is a presumed intention from the circumstances. Constructive trust is implied by law, independent of the party's intentions. So that's where you very often come with form over substance and form and things like that. Uh, we have exposed it now. There is a specific part of the trust ordinance dealing with constructive trust. It is from section 82 to 97. Obviously, I can't take you through that, but I am flagging in constructive trust. So unlike a express trust, a constructive trust is not created by an agreement between an author of the trust and the trustee. A constructive trust is imposed by law as an equitable remedy. So it's a remedy that being granted by the equity in certain circumstances in the absence of any specific intention created a trust, but constructively, court says, this is a remedy I will give you. The circumstances, you can establish, you can find a trust and consequently hold the owner of the property who claims it is his to all the principles of trust and duties and obligations and, and uh, others. So generally, this occurs due to some wrongdoing where the wrongdoer has acquired legal title to some property and cannot, this is where equity comes in, and cannot in good conscience be allowed to benefit from it. That is why it's independent of any intention. In good conscience, that is equity. That is the equitable principle of the English law, which is very different from the English common law principle. That's another area of law I don't want to go into. But remember, these are very minute distinctions in, in law that, have, that are very important when you are handling a trust matter. I put it that way. So in, if the court finds that it cannot in good conscience permit you to claim a benefit from the property that you hold for somebody else, then they will say, I a constructed trust is created. So it's a creation. That trust is a creation of a legal fiction. Now, section 82 to 97 gives you several instances of, um, of uh, if I, I don't know for how time is running, 82 for instance, uh, I'll tell you, for example, um, where the owner of property transfers or bequeaths it, this is 83, and cannot reasonably be, and it cannot reasonably be inferred consistently with the attendant circumstances, that he intend to dispose of, of the beneficial interest therein, the transferee or legatee must hold such property for the benefit of the owner or his legal representative. So if I give you some property, hold it, darling, I'm running away, these fellows are, are coming, chasing me, to look, after, to look after it and things like that, then I can come back and claim it because thereby those circumstances, court will imply you have created a constructive trust. There's lots of cases on that. We have no time to examine the case law, but remember that is the principle that they to establish in over the earth. That is a thing called the discretionary trust. Um, it is a discretionary trust if the certainly the object is satisfied. You know, if it can be satisfied, then there's a criterion which a person must satisfy as a beneficiary uh, to whether there is a class of beneficiaries of class of beneficiaries, so and so of people of Dean Street, Maradara, or number so and so to so and so. In that way, a person who satisfies the criteria who are members of a class of the such person can enforce the trust and discourage the trust. Don't worry, it didn't have many discourage trusts here. So it, it's part of the overview. So the common base with the trust is created then, usually a written instrument created by the set law and signed by both the settler and trustees is a what is called an interview or see because we are passing in 
immovable property you need to have a notarily attested. So that is why you have an instrument coming in and a declaration of trust in the trustee and there's a deed of trust and there'll be a deed of transfer of the property to the trustees in terms of the trust uh, that is declared in a separate deed and things like that. There can be an oral declaration of promise. You see, oral declaration. So it doesn't need to be writing all the time. Creation. Whether it be a constructed trust, that's created and things like that, that's another issue, but you can create a trust in a constructed trust, otherwise, a oral declaration. Or in a will, usually thing, you will, you will, you can create a trust in the will of the decedent, usually called the testamentary trust. Or a court can make order, as I said earlier, uh, in circumstances declaring a result in trust and things like that. Now, formalities. Formalities record of a trust depends on the type of trust in question. So, because a trustee to become a legal owner need to have the trust supposed to be transferred to him. Anchor coin, things like that, you have that usual thing, other movable property. If it is land, then it has to be by a notarily attested deed. So that is has to be one form. Generally, a private express has required three elements to be certain. Then let us to find whether there's a trust or no. There are what we call basically three elements. Those are called the three certainties. Like the three wise monkeys, you have three certainties um, in, in the trust to see whether there's a trust. One is called the intention. The three certainties are intention, subject matter, and objects. Intention. The certainty of intention allows the court to exercise a settler's true reason for creating a trust. So I said it can be an oral trust, a mere expression of hope that a trust be created does not constitute an intention to create a trust. So when you talk about a constructive trust, these things will become um, crucial. Was it a hope that was being expressed or was it a settled intention to create a trust? So a mere expression of the hope that a trust may be created does not constitute an intention to create a trust. Conversely, the existence of terms of art in terms of art are special terms which you know, normally you won't use, but if some use some normal terms also become terms of art. For instance, the word trust can be used in normal as okay, you had a trustee's fellow sort of thing. That's in created trust. It becomes a term of art if the trust is used in a sense contemplated under the trust ordinance that the creation of an obligation and next to the ownership of property whereby one nominally holds the legal title there to the beneficial interests are in another called the beneficiary who is entitled to the equitable ownership. Now that is the intention that must surface from whatever you are trying to create by reason from the intention. Trust not does indicate whether the use of the word trust does not indicate whether an instrument is an express trust or no. Disputes in this area mainly concern differentiating gifts from trusts. I gave the property to him and so and so, gift from trust. Subject matter. If it's land, of course, you will say it's a gift or it's the donor, the donor, he must sign and things like that. But if it's otherwise, then the question is, you can say, oh no, he gifted to me. He said, no, 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 that was a trust. You had to hold it for me. It wasn't gifted to you. Uh, expensive pendant. Uh, um, your wife spent then you go your girlfriend you <laughs> she said it was given to me he said no no, no you must say give it to me give it back to me I don't know. yeah subject matter third second in certainty subject matter the property of the subject to the trust must be clearly identified that is you must say what is the property is right uh, one may not for example state Settle the majority of my estate is a will. As the precise extent cannot be ascertained. You see, the property, black cake, and such and such a place, you give to my son or held and trust, okay. Buy all my property in Jaffna, won't do. Because nobody knows where, where your properties are. So there's not the certainty of the subject matter. 
So that is important if you are drafting trust instrument, you have to be careful with it. I speak of gland because that's a common theme, but whether it be jewelry or whatever, there must be a clear identification of the subject matter of the trust, the trust property, right? Trust property may be in the form of specific property, be it real, personal, or personal, tangible or intangible, tangible, but you can touch and throw the table, or intangible may be something else, right? Intangible, it is often, for example, real estate, often it's really land, immobile property, shares or cash or things like that. So identifying the subject matter is very important. Intention is very important. Subject matter is important. So impress a property with the obligation and actually ownership implies it must be a precisely identified. Then object. Why are you doing this? Right? Beneficiaries of the trust must be, whom are you doing it for? Beneficiary of the trust must be clearly identified. In English law, you often told uh, the poor of Smithfield or, or the East End, now East End is a very expensive place those days, in the um, early last century and all, most of the old trustees think the poor of the East End or poor of that, that borough or so on so like that, they knew who they were. But, but you have to be, so then you can identify. I, like I said, the, the, the poor children at Panchakavate may not do. Our children um, the top of Dean Street to top of um, so-and-so might be an identifiable lot, right? So the object of the, the object here being the beneficiary. Beneficiary, the trust must be clearly identified or at least be ascertainable in the case of discretionary trust. When the trustees have power to decide who the beneficiaries will be, sometimes trusts are created which say who shall be the beneficiary. The set law, the author of trust must have, must have described a clear class of beneficiaries, the people of so-and-so street in Kalamba 5 or people of so-and-so uh, at Kataragama or whatever. So you are, so if you're referring to a group of people whom you wish to benefit, the villagers of this, this village by bounded by so and so, so and so. It's some identifiable class of person who become a clear class who can be identified to be able to carry out the objects of the trust. Alternately, or this should be charitable purpose. Charity is for, where there's a chapter dealing with uh, charities in the trust ordinance. Uh, I think Anila um, has surfaced. I think I must come to the end of my time or perhaps exceeded it. So, um, so I think uh, beneficiaries, I have said who they are. So that sort of overview of very vast subject is like a bird's eye view and not uh, focused in a sort of thing. Bird's eye view only. Thank you very much, Anila. Is that all right? My time is up anyway. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. You've covered a lot of ground, I think, in the very, very short period of time that you had. Thank you so much. Uh, and I uh, just before um, we get on to Rwandi, I would like to encourage our participants to put up any questions that they have for our panelists uh, in the Q&A uh, box. And then once all the panelists speak, um, we will uh, submit those questions um, to the panelists. Uh, Rwandi, over to you now. Thanks, Ranila. Good evening, everyone. Um, my discussion today will center on the subject of using trust, express trust actually, as an instrument of estate planning, particularly focusing on creating a trust to provide for beneficiaries over an extended period of time without giving it outright, which could be for various reasons. This could actually be because the family has uh, a minor to provide for, or there is a family member who is unable to manage his or her own affairs and needs to be provided for. Or it could be the intention of the set law, that is the person setting up the trust, that the beneficiary should not get access to the capital of the trust immediately until they reach a specified age, or there is some milestone to be met, and still, but still be able to benefit from the income from the assets. As Dr. Kanageshwaran explained in his presentation, the fundamental premise of a trust law is that the legal ownership of assets is separated from the persons who hold the beneficial right to enjoy the assets. So in setting up trust, 
uh, as Dr. Kanageshwaran explained, the trust ordinance mandates that the author of the trust comply with several elements of in creating a trust, which must be indicated with reasonable certainty. Uh, that is the intention to create a trust, the trust purpose or the object of the trust, the beneficiary or the beneficiaries, the trust property, and unless the trust is declared by last will or by the author himself is the trustee, actually take steps to transfer the trust property to the trustee. Uh, so based on this underlying premise, I will discuss several aspects in using a trust as a tool for estate planning and specifically focus on what should be included in the trustee that is drafted to create this kind of arrangement. So who can be the trustee? That is the person who's setting up the trust. This could be one parent or both parents, both being competent to contract and being the owner of the assets. And they can set up the trust naming their children as beneficiaries. The trust can be set up during the lifetime of the parents or be created through the last will, meaning it will only come into effect when the, after the demise of the testators. So if the trust is created during the lifetime, does this mean that the settlor needs to transfer the entirety of their wealth, which would normally be covered by a last will, to the trustees at the time of creating the trust? This is a, trust, this is a question that actually comes up very often since the settlers who want to create the trust don't want to give away the ownership rights to the assets right away or involve third parties, that is the trustees, in managing the assets while they are still alive. So the setting up the trust could be arranged in such a way that you set up the trust with a nominal capital and kept on standby mode, where a last will can be done to transfer the bulk of the estate to the trust after the demise of the settlers. And the trust will be, the trustees of the trust will be named as the beneficiaries under the last will. This is, this is how a trust would work in the instance where the trustees, uh, where the bulk of the estate would come into the trust through a last will. Uh, but it must be borne in mind that even though a trust has nominal capital and is on standby mode, the trustee is appointed into the role and will have administration and fiduciary duties, such as maintaining accounts, payment of taxes to do in the interim years. Um, as uh, Dr. Carnegie Sharon explained, everybody who is capable of holding property and having contractual capacity can be a trustee. It can be a trusted individual, several individuals, or a limited liability company, which could even be a corporate trustee who provide professional services to the clients. The powers of a trustee will come, I mean, is set out in the law, but it is also uh, set out in the trust instrument. So it, depending on the set law's wishes, it can be as expansive or as limited as set out in the trust instrument, where you can clearly spell out where the trustees are permitted to exercise discretion and where that discretion is limited. Um, something to be borne in mind in this situation is trustees are not only liable for statutory obligations and legal liability under the trustee, but they also have very high standards of fiduciary duties under the law. So in order for a trust to be valid and for property to be vested in the trustee, another aspect is that the trustee must accept the trusteeship, which is why, as Dr. Kanageshwaran explained, both the trust, the settler and the trustees are parties to the trustee. So in the event that you are naming trustees through a last will, this is something that must be borne in mind. The persons who you have named as trustees should probably be vetted and kept informed that this is something that you're setting up because you, you may have them out, you may have identified them in that role, but they probably might not accept the trusteeships at that point. Uh, also in this context, something that must be mentioned is that you must also, you know, while it is possible to appoint several individuals as trustees, it is recommended that a manageable number of trustees be appointed. Ideally resident in Sri Lanka, since the administrative work involved in doing even routine, simple things like opening bank accounts, uh, CDS accounts, disclosure and filing of accounts, tax returns, can be very difficult where the trustees are located in several countries. 
I mean, if you have uh, something like seven trustees, please note that you know there are only three people who can be nominated as uh, joint account holders in CDS forms and bank account openings. So this creates a issue because uh, under Sri Lankan law, the concept of a custodian trustee is not covered in the trust ordinance. And it also something else that must be borne in mind when you're creating a trust, where land is very often the subject matter of the trust. A foreign citizen cannot be registered as a legal owner of immovable property. And in that situation, non-Sri Lankan citizens cannot be considered in the role of trustees where land is part of the trust property. And another thing that uh, Dr. Kanageshwaran mentioned, uh, a same person can wear many hats in relation to a trust. So the person who is setting up the trust can also act as a trustee of the trust. So in this situation, where it is actually a situation where the set law is basically changing the nature of his or her ownership from absolute owner to only legal owner with beneficial interest vested in some other person. And in the situation of using a trust as an estate planning instrument, one of the key questions is who can be the beneficiaries under a trust? A beneficiary can be every person capable of holding property in an ascertainable class of persons. In the instance of its estate planning, this category will include children, grandchildren, any other named person, or a company, or even include the author of the trust as well. The trust can be structured to list out various beneficiaries in several tiers with specified milestones or timelines as to when each category or tier of beneficiary will stand to benefit under the trust. So it's not just simply a matter of listing out names, if careful thought is given, it can be structured in many ways where each one comes into their entitlement at specified timelines. And like Dr. Kanageshwar mentioned, beneficiaries of a trust must be clearly identifiable with reasonable certainty with, and there must be some way of ascertaining this class of persons. It could be with reference to a family lineage or institution or a register or a list and it is a must have element for the validity of a trust. So that must be something that must be carefully vetted because uh, this can be the reason why a trust would fail if there is no reasonable certainty to indicate the pool of beneficiaries. Then you might wonder, can the author of the trust be the trustee and the beneficiary at the same time? Well, if you're considering it in the sole capacity without anyone else acting with him and or her as a core trustee or anyone else included in the pool of beneficiaries, this would not be possible because it's uh, it's not a it, it's that's not a concept that's you know upholds the concept of a trust. Uh, so if there are others included in the category and you're not the sole trustee or the beneficiary, then yes. Then we can also look at what is possible to be trust property when you're you know, setting up a trust. It can be any asset representing immobile property, company shares, bank deposits that is capable of being transferred to a beneficiary. And the object of a trust, another certainty that is requ required for it to be a valid trust should be any purpose that is not forbidden by law or defeats the law's intention or is fraudulent or causes injury to anyone or is immoral or opposed to public policy. This actually will serve as an interpretative guide in evaluating the mandate of the trustee in administrating, administering the trust. It should be expansive, covering all of the objects that is cited, but also be very clear. It is, and also it's not recommended that this is something capable of being amended at a subsequent point of time. For an example, um, if the trust object is to hold property and premises in trust for furtherance of education or religion in that premises, are you permitted to donate funds for other institutions or trusts as donations or contributions where those institutions are engaged in similar activities? If the trust is established for the benefit of family members, it's easy to argue that you know, the funds in trust can be utilized for education or medical expenses 
but would this cover providing capital to start up a business? So this is again why, you know, with purposes of setting up the trust must be carefully thought out with bearing in mind the, you know, what the family members would require in future. Um, I would um, also a uh, few things to bear in mind in drafting the trustee, uh, especially in instances where the trustee is created through the last will. Since the author of the trust would not be aware around to provide clarity or effect amendments, if sufficient details are not included, the trustees would not be able to act, even in fairly routine matters where banks or authorities will want specifics and clarity on the extent of the trustee's power to administer the trust property. This will result in the trustee having to file applications in court seeking approval at every juncture or obtain the unanimous, have to obtain the unanimous consent of all the beneficiaries being competent to contract before following a course of action. In, in the context of that legal requirement, a few items I would recommend that you carefully look at in drafting a trustee would be the type of instruments which the trustees are permitted to invest in. If it is not clearly mentioned, the trustee lists out uh, in section 20, lists out a list of instruments which the trustees are permitted to in invest in and it is primary mortgages, government securities, unless the trust instrument specifies otherwise. So therefore, if you give expansive powers to the trustee, listing out the kind of instruments that the trustee can, securities that the trustee can invest in, they are able to do so. And this is something the investing body would also look at to see if the trustee is empowered to actually invest in these things. Uh, another thing to very clearly set out in the trust instrument would be the trustee's ability to sell the trust property and vary investments. If you, uh, the trust ordinance mandates that you know you need court permission to lease out a property beyond 10 years. So there are restrictions on the trustee's powers. So this is something that uh, must be clearly spelled out. Also, unless you have court permission or statutory provision, and unless the trust instrument clearly expressly permits this, the trustee cannot charge for his or her troubles, skill or loss of time in administering the trust. So this might be something that you want to consider because otherwise people might decline to be trustees and uh, you may not be able to engage a professional corporate trustee to administer the trust for you. Is the trustee permitted to distribute only the income or also the capital of the trust? Uh, is the trustee bound to distribute all the income in hand after expenses or can a portion be retained within the trust for management purposes or to build up a fund for emergencies? So very, very common situations, but it has to be clearly spelled out. Otherwise the trustee would not have the power to do things like that. If a trustee wants to renounce or re resign after accepting the trusteeship, this power must be specifically included in the trustee. And another thing which is causing a lot of administrative issues is actually the trustee has to clearly spell out how new trustees will be appointed and by who, and any selection criteria for the appointment of trustees. So, because of that, I mean, trustees are individuals and unlike a corporate, will not have perpetual existence. Therefore, there will be changeovers, there will be deaths, migrations, all of that. So this is something that must, that is very common and unless the trustees are validly and correctly appointed through a notarial deed, uh, it will be very difficult to administer the trust for the other trustees. Then also another very important aspect, when would a trust be wound up? And how would the trust property be distributed at the end? How would you split it amongst the beneficiaries? And the power to revoke a trust must also be expressly set out in the trustee. So, it, it, it shouldn't be something that is set out in a couple of lines saying that, you know, I, I bequeath these properties to the, my trustee to administer in trust because a lot of different elements must be looked at and considered and carefully drafted because otherwise the trustee's hands will be tied in achieving the trust objects. 
also i would like to give a little insight into the administration at the back end uh, if, if 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 a set law things that you know i would like to provide for my family but without really disclosing who and how and you know the income is coming through and what is deductible please note that the law says that the beneficiaries have a right to the trust instrument and also given the current legal regime it is not possible to keep the trust instrument confidential. This is actually something that the banks would ask for at the time of account opening and even under the trust information relating to express trust regulations of 2019. The trust deed along with the disclosure schedule has to be filed with the Register General and also at the applicable land registry. Uh, this schedule has information on the set laws, the trustees, the beneficiaries, the trust property, and actually even who advised, who, the, who the advisors were at the time of setting up the trust. This information is kept up, is to be kept updated every three months and information retained for a period of six years. So it's not possible to have confidential trust. The, you know, this information is kept confidential because in fact, under the money laundering regulations that are enforced now, the banks and all the parties dealing with the, trust would want to comply with their KYC requirements. And there is a lot of information that has to be given out, including scaling back all the layers as to who the ultimate beneficial owner of the trust is and right up to who might have at least 10% of interest in the trust. So these aspects must be borne in mind when considering a trust as an instrument of estate planning. And for this reason, a trustee should be expansive and empower the trustees to do all the routine matters and also cover emergencies. But it should not also be overly complicated and have many layers of structuring because it is also going to create a lot of problems for the family. So there are these thoughts in mind when considering trusts as an as a instrument of estate planning because very often sometimes Families also have no other way to provide for needy family members who are minors or who are not capable of managing their own affairs because the other route would be to go to court and pronounce them as members as persons of unsound mind, which a lot of people are reluctant to do. So I hope this information is useful when considering this option. Um, if there are any questions, I will take it at the end of the session. Over to you. Thank you very much, Ruandi. And you gave us a lot of, um, you covered a lot of practical aspects which we should consider when we are drafting the trust instrument. So thank you very much for that. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Suresh Pereira to give his presentation. Over to you, Mr. Pereira. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me begin by thanking the Bar Association for inviting me to uh, participate in this uh, very important webinar. And uh, this is a very interesting subject from the point of view of taxation. Now we listen to the uh, legal aspects pertaining to uh, trust. Uh, in this New England Revenue Act, there is a definition given for trust. And Dr. Kanagishwan started with the definition in the trust division, uh, trust ordinance in relation to trust. Uh, what we find is a very uh, simple uh, definition that is there. And it goes on to say that uh, trust means an arrangement under which a trustee holds uh, assets. But there's a very wide definition given for the term trustee. And that includes uh, even executor, administrator, receiver, uh, so on and so forth. Right? So when you look at that definition, you can see it's a very wide definition that is there. And the, the, the distinction between the concept of trust uh, for in the eyes of the law and the uh, taxation in the eyes of uh, Inland Revenue Act is that for the purpose of the Inland Revenue Act, this is considered a taxable entity. In other words, this is a, uh, this is a, this can be a body, this is a uh, entity, can be an entity. Whereas in the eyes of the law, the trust is not an entity. A partnership is not an entity. It's basically the assets and the liabilities are held by the trustees and the assets and liabilities of a partnership are held are in the name of the partners. But for tax purposes, there's a distinction because uh, this, can, this is uh, defined to be a uh, 
entity also. When you go through the definitions, you can uh, see that aspect of the entity definition and the uh, person definition and the body definition given in the inland revenue. So that's the main, uh, the first difference that I want to bring up. And so when it comes to taxation, everything starts from the concept of residency. Because if you are a resident, the applicable tax rules are different. And if you are a non-resident, then uh, the basis of taxation changes. So when will, what is the rule in relation residing the residency of taxation? Uh, there are three criteria given in the act. Uh, and that's basically if the trust has been established in Sri Lanka, then it's a uh, resident, not trust. Or basically, if a trustee is resident in if the trustee is resident in Sri Lanka, then also it's considered a uh, residence. Uh, it's, the trust is considered a resident uh, in Sri Lanka for tax purposes. Or anytime during the year, if a person is resident in Sri Lanka, directs or directs the affairs of the trust, then that that also results in the trust being considered a uh, resident trust uh, for income tax purposes. Right now. Uh, from there onwards, uh, I think, again, Dr. Kanishwaran was uh, explaining the concept of trust. He explained different categories or different types of trust. Now, when it comes to uh, income tax also, there could be uh, different types of trust depending on uh, the criteria that are given in the Inland Revenue Act. So under certain, and, and depending on that, the tax rules, uh, change the differ. So there's this basic concept called the present entitlement. I think I need to spend a little bit of time explaining this because this is a misunderstood concept in the corporate sector. I don't think we have uh, understood this aspect. Much uh, more attention is being paid. There's this concept called present entitlement in relation to tax, uh, in relation to trust, and specifically in the context of taxation. Now, this concept is something, seems to be something uh, new in the Sri Lankan uh, tax system. I think this is the first time we have seen this concept called present entitlement in a tax statute. But when you go and study the uh, laws or basically the case laws, decided the case laws in the other countries, you can see this crucial point has been debated, decided in many uh, foreign judgments starting from 1940s. And if I give you a list of uh, cases uh, in relation to this, uh, you can see uh, in 1946, the very first uh, or the first case that I found, uh, Witting, uh, decided in 1942, uh, has set out a rule with regard to the concept of present entitlement. And then uh, again, you can see Taylor Anna somewhere in 1970s, and from there Harmer again in 1991. And then there's a very important judgment Pearson decided in uh, 2006. And in 2008 also, there is another judgment I found, uh, again, in relation to this concept. Now, so what is this concept called present entitlement? This basically uh, talks of the right of a beneficiary. If a beneficiary has what is called a present entitlement, then it is the, it is the beneficiary who should pay tax, not the trust. The general rule given in the act is trust and the beneficiary are two different types and the trust should pay taxes separately, the beneficiary should pay taxes separately. But in case of a beneficiary who has the present entitlement, it is the beneficiary that should pay the tax and not the trust. And this is where this concept called pass-through trust comes in. I use the word bear trust uh, in relation to this distinction, the bear trust and the entity trust. So sometimes the trust can be uh, if the beneficiaries do not have the present entitlement, the trust must pay the tax. And when the trust makes the distribution to the beneficiary, that beneficiary is exempt from, that distribution is exempt uh, in the hands of the beneficiary. But however, if the, uh, as I mentioned, if the beneficiary has the present entitlement, then it is the beneficiary that should pay the tax and not the uh, trust. Right, now what is this present entitlement? So these cases that have been, uh, decided has established a definition for that and basically there are two things one is there should be a vested a vested right and in vested and indivisible right given to the uh, beneficiary in relation to the income and also he should have the beneficiary should have the right to demand for the payment 
right to demand for the uh, payment in relation to the income. So if that is there, then it is said that uh, the beneficiary has a present entitlement. Now, where do you find whether these features are, are embedded? That is, of course, you have to go to the trust instrument, go and check and see the rights given in the trust deed. So from that, so that's going, that's going to become the starting point in relation to the application of the tax rule. So if a, uh, if a, if a uh, trust deed does not have the present entitlement given to the beneficiaries, then the uh, trust will pay the tax and the distribution to the beneficiaries uh, exit. But if, if that's not the case, then uh, the beneficiaries have to pay the tax and section 57.2 uh, goes on to basically give the certain rules that are applicable in relation to this particular concept, right? Now, so th this, is, this, is, this is a key aspect when it comes to uh, the concept of unit trust, uh, also what are called real estate investment trust, in relation to deciding the tax consequences. So uh, depending on this aspect, the distribution to the trustee, the unit holder, whether it is liable or not, will depend on, right? So I will record it for the purpose of uh, this webinar, uh, this uh, distinction should be made. Again, another thing that I want to mention is, in relation to present entitlement, uh, there are two things. So basically present entitlement is twofold present entitlement for the income and present entitlement for the capital. Now, what we have in the Inland Revenue Act is the present entitlement for income, not the present entitlement for the capital. So something again that we have to keep in mind when it comes to the concept of the unit trust, when you are ascertaining whether the unit trust it has given, uh, embed the, present, the concept of present entitlement or not, right? So, so that's, uh, that's the point I think that we need to keep in mind. And from there onwards, uh, let me go on to give you in a, nutshell quickly as to how the tax rules will be applicable. So, so, so trust now can be divided into uh, two categories, main two categories, depending on that the entity trust and the, what I call a bear trust or what some people call as the uh, pass-through trust. So in case of pass-through trust, that is what basically uh, when it comes to all these commercial trusts like unit trust or real estate trust, the people desire it to be. So the, the, the intermediary, that is the trust, uh, it's not uh, paying tax and it's the beneficiary that should be paying tax, right? Uh, but if it's the entity trust, as I mentioned, okay, uh, the trustee must pay tax and at what rate the trustee has to pay taxes at the rate of 18% after the new amendment that has been introduced now, right? Uh, so if it is a uh, bear trust, the the beneficiary, there, there could be two types of beneficiary, the individual beneficiary or a corporate beneficiary. If it's an individual beneficiary uh, in relation to the income that he is presently entitled, he has to pay taxes according to his normal tax rates. In Sri Lanka, what are the normal tax rates? 6, 12, and 18. The first three, first three million is at the rate of 6%, and the next uh, slab of 3 million at the rate of 12%, and the remainder at the rate of 18%. And Something that we have to keep in mind also when it comes to uh, uh, a trust, in the case of a trustee, trustee is not entitled for the 3 million personal relief uh, that we all enjoy, right? Uh, then, then again, we have this concept of uh, a person, incapacitated person. So if there's an incapacitated person, other than case of a minor, how, the, how is that uh, trust, uh, trust is going to get taxed? then it's to be taxed as an individual. The rate slabs that I mentioned will be applicable there also. Uh, right, now I think the other important aspect is uh, when it comes to trust, we always talk about the concept of charitable trust and uh, the benefits that are there or how it is, right? Now, a charitable trust could be, a uh, if the charitable trust falls within the definition of the charitable institution given in the act, there's a definition given in the charitable institution, I won't go into the, uh, the detail, then that will be taxed, the charitable institution will be taxed at the rate of 14%. Uh, and, the, and if the charitable institution is, uh, how do I say, it's engaged in, uh, how say, it is providing institutionalized care for the sick and needy, then the person who is making a donation to that uh, charitable institution 
can get 100% tax reduction in relation to that donation by way of qualifying payment deduction. So that donation will get, get uh, classified as a qualifying payment and a uh, deduction could be uh, taken. And uh, again, now this concept of charitable institution, when you're discussing that, there's another concept, another concept that is there, the concept of approved charity. Now, what is an approved charity? If the, uh, if the minister has approved is approved charity, then only the, this label or the this terminology called approved charity kicks in. And in that case, uh, in case of a approved charity, when a donation is made, in, if, it's, if the donor happens to be an individual, the donor can uh, get a deduction, uh, basically it's restricted to one third of his taxable income or 75%, 75,000 rupees, whichever is the lower. So up to that threshold, up to that limit, uh, an individual donor making a donation to an uh, approved charity uh, can get a uh, deduction. But on the other hand, if it is a, if the donor happens to be a corporate, then that corporate can get a uh, deduction up to one fifth of the taxable income. In case of a uh, individual, it's one third of the taxable income. But in case of a corporate, it's uh, one fifth of the taxable income or five lakhs, whichever is the lower amount. So those are basically the, uh, the general rules in relation to uh, tax law. Now I will want to touch, uh, uh, but again, another thing that you have to keep in mind is in case of a charitable institution, it can't be a bear trust, but you call a pass through trust. The charitable institution will be governed, uh, will be considered a taxable entity. Uh, Right now, the rules rules in relation to tax are governed. Yeah, they are in two simple sections, fifty seven and fifty eight. Fifty eight basically deals with distribution to the uh, beneficiary, and it goes on to say that in case of an entity trust, distribution to the beneficiary is tax exempt. The beneficiary is not liable for tax. Very important rule we have to keep in mind because. Subsequent section goes on to give the rules in relation to taxation of what is called unit trust. I think it's a concept that we all know. Uh, it's an instrument that is uh, listed in the Colombo Stock Exchange. Now, how a unit trust will attract taxation. Now, when it goes to the, that section, section 59, again, uh, there's a condition. Uh, a unit trust could be considered a company or could be considered a uh, trust. If that, that is dependent upon this concept, this condition call, is the uh, unit trust engaged in making what are called eligible investments? If the unit trust is uh, engaged in what are called eligible investments, then it is considered as a trust, not as a company. So what are eligible in investments? Eligible investments are again defined in the act to mean uh, financial instruments or uh, capital assets and capital assets again are defined. I won't go into that. But in practice, what we have is uh, because of the uh, rules in the unit trust board in Sri Lanka, a unit trust can only invest in uh, financial instruments. So because of that, uh, it is basically always engaged in investing in eligible uh, investments. And therefore, it will be considered a trust. Right, not as a company. Under the old Inland Revenue Act, it was different. Under the old Inland Revenue Act, a unit trust was considered a company, so the rules applicable to a company was applicable, and a unit was considered a share, and the payment on the unit was considered a dividend payment, and so all those tax rules applicable to company was applicable to a unit trust. But in practice, in Sri Lanka, uh, you won't find. Uh, basically, all unit trust uh, you can say are uh, basically uh, trusts. So when it comes to trust, now we come to that main classification that we discussed. Uh, is this an entity trust? Is this going to become a uh, bear trust? That means a pass-through trust. So if it is a pass-through trust, that is what we all wish it to be. Uh, there won't be tax uh, at the level of the uh, at the level of the trust. It's that beneficiary that will be paying tax. For something to be considered a bear trust or what you call a pass-through trust, what is the condition given in the Inland Revenue Act? Present entitlement. What is present entitlement? In the trust deed, 
there should be uh, vested and indivisible right uh, for income uh, given to the beneficiary. And the beneficiary should have the uh, right to demand payment uh, at any time he or she wants. Now, if that characteristics are basically embedded in the trust deed, then uh, it will be a it will be a pass through trust or bear trust, and the trust will not be subject to tax. It's the trustees that will be liable to. Uh, it is the it is the beneficiaries that will be liable to tax. So if that is if that condition that present entitlement condition is not fulfilled in the uh, trust deed, then what is the consequence? It's very simple. The trust will have to pay tax and distribution by the trust to the beneficiary. Who is the beneficiary here? The unit holder, the unit unit holder of a unit trust. The distribution to the unit holder is free of income tax. That is the clear rule in the Inland Revenue Act. Now, this is something a uh, concept that uh, I think uh, not understood uh, correctly in Sri Lanka as of now. Right, from there onwards, uh, I'll go on to speak a uh, little bit in relation to this new instrument called Real Estate Investment Trust that has been uh, introduced uh, in Sri Lanka. Right, now what is the uh, rate for those who uh, are new to this concept? This is, a, this is, a, this is also a sub, how do you say, a part of a, a kind of a unit trust. And uh, what is this uh, used for? Now, unit trusts are basically used to pool funds and uh, many parties, how to say, small investors to pool the funds and uh, the trustees, uh, the, the managing company, there's a party called managing company that is looking after the funds in the trust and using the expertise, they obtain the better return, a best return, a better return for the benefit of the small investors who may not have the uh, expertise to invest in these financial instruments. Right, so what is the real estate uh, investment trust? Real estate investment trust is uh, again a, a vehicle to pool uh, the investments and invest in real estate. The difference is here the investment uh, is in real estate. Now, just like in case of a unit trust, units are issued and these units are purchased by the in these units, the investments could be made by uh, small investors. Now, you know, basically, if you want to uh, take, if you want to benefit from uh, the appreciation of real estate, then you need to have a big pocket to uh, invest in real estate. Now, so therefore, basically, uh, the enjoyment of the appreciation of uh, uh, real estate. Uh, cannot be uh, enjoyed by small-time investors. So this is an instrument, this is a mechanism introduced to all small-time investors also to uh, reap the benefit of real estate. So they will also get, uh, likewise in a company like a shareholder, they also basically can make investment and they can get a return and they can sell the uh, units. Now, okay, I'll get one more minute. Uh, so. In order to, in order to, uh, in order to, uh, how do I say, promote the realist uh, REITs in Sri Lanka, the government in the last budget gave very generous tax concession. So, when, uh, when let's say the completed uh, buildings uh, are being properties are being transferred to uh, to establish a real estate, uh, the sponsor, the ter terminology is called used to sponsor, and the gains gains. Uh, derived by the sponsor is exempt from income tax. Uh, not only that, in, in relation to individual investor in the units, the return, that means the dividend that they receive as well as when they trade in, when they sell the units, the gain or the profit that they get is also exempt from income tax. Okay, so I'll stop there whenever we go on. Basically, we'll take uh, more questions. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pereira, and thank you very much for covering some of these um, new ways in which uh, the trust instrument is, is going to be used, like REITs. So thank you very much for that. Uh, now we will quickly move on to the Q&A session. Um, I will, uh, uh, the first question that we have, I believe, um, is for Dr. Kanagiswaran. 
Uh, sir, uh, we have a question. Uh, um, a participant wants to know whether a trustee can also be the beneficiary and whether a settlor can be a beneficiary. Uh, sir, I'm, uh, I'm afraid we can't hear you. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I have. <laughs> keep forgetting to unmute it. No, you know, um, I think as Ruanti pointed out correctly, um, if one goes by the definition of a trust, it speaks of the uh, owner of the property and trustee may be the same, but the other person, beneficiary, must be, cannot be the trustee himself. It says a trust is an obligation and it's the ownership of a property arising out of a confidence, the person accepted by the owner and declared accepted by him for the benefit of another person. So if the another person can't be the trustee, owner can be the trustee, owner trustee, trustee legal title, and he's holding for the benefit of another person. By that definition, though in some some commentaries you abroad you they say all can be all can is what they call the life trust all can be in the same thing. But I think by the definition, we seem to exclude uh, the beneficiary and the trustee being the same. I don't know how, how you have done it, Ruanti, in your drafting thing, but um, I haven't come across a situation here in Sri Lanka where this uh, matter has been looked into. Uh, would you help us on that? Sir, we, uh, the trustee and the beneficiary haven't been the same in anything uh, we have set up either. But yeah. what I mentioned was it cannot be the, you know, you cannot actually be in a sole capacity because that undermines the entire concept. Like you That's said, right. it has to be another person. Yeah, because definition says another person, not the definition as Suresh pointed out in the act of the Ghanaian Act, Ghanaian Act, which has become Sri Lankan Act. So you have concepts never heard of before. I learned, I must thank you. I learned something about the, what is called, uh, what did you call that? Um, hmm. I was following your section 50, present entitlement. <laughs> Interesting point. Let's do a seminar on that. <laughs> Perhaps you have done it. Sorry, sorry, uh, Branila. I've been having to talk into other this week. That was, what that question, I mean, that that's clear from the definition, you know. That's what I said. We have to be careful when dealing with the English concept of trust. It's not, we have to be governed, you know, Dr. Kure in his book deals with these lovely aspects, nuances of our trust act. We survey, I mean, I don't think anybody reads it. It's very heavy. But uh, one studies that, studied it long ago, uh, one could appreciate that. But if simply going by, when you have a code or a, an act dealing with definition, you simply can't move away from it. Yes, if, I there, sir, a trustee, if I add there, uh, a trustee uh, has to has is exercising a fiduciary duty. So if you happen to be the beneficiary, you can't uh, fulfill that. No, there will be a conflict. Thank you very much. Uh, the second question, uh, I believe, um, Ruandi, this is for you. Uh, can a fixed deposit be uh, trust property? Yes, a fixed deposit can be a trust property. Uh, if you are transferring, I mean, if it's in the settler's name and if you're transferring it to the trustee, uh, that should be mentioned as trust property for the bank to recognize that a trust has been created over it. Or the trustee could place fixed deposits from the cash that has been handed over to the trustee. So then in that case, the, the fixed deposit will be opened in the name of the trustee. Um, the next question is, uh, I will uh, put it to the entire panel. Um, anyone uh, who wishes to answer, please go ahead. Are there any reported incidents where trusts have been created for money laundering purposes? If so, is it a valid trust? That's a good question. The, the question is whether there are reported cases uh, in Sri Lanka we don't have. <laughs> we, we have some very old cases in relation to trust, but in Sri Lanka, we don't have. Under our law, trust can be created only for a lawful object. So by money laundering, by definition, would be unlawful. So you cannot, though they use trust to hide money laundering, 
this. <laughs> but uh, under our law, it has to be for a lawful object. So that, so whether a particular transaction, evidence in the trust uh, instrument is lawful or unlawful, will be determined by the law of the land, law of the, depending on the jurisdiction. It will be, so it has to be lawful. There's no question about that. Uh, then there is a, a question, um, again, I believe it's for you, sir. Uh, uh, could you please explain section 85 of the trust ordinance a little more, is the request. That is a, that's one of those difficulties, that's on the, um, what do you call this, uh, 85. Constructive trust, 85. Trusts, I read it out loud, uh, where a trust is incapable of being executed uh, or where the trust is completely executed without exhausting the trust property, trustee in the absence of a direction to the contrary must hold the trust property or so much thereof as is unexhausted for the benefit of the author of the trust or his legal acceptance, a legal representative. Now, you see, I don't want to go into the question of the CPRA, but you will see as a section dealing with extinction of trust. So trust can be, so you have to read this section in line with what they are taught, incapable of being executed. So the purpose, the object for which um, classic example in English law they teach you, they say the uh, poor of Smithfield or poor of Eastern. Now today Eastern is a high premium when I was studying there, that was a place nobody will dare go. If you go there full of trailers and ships and you have to be very careful though you have lovely pubs you used to visit. But today all the up and coming, up and up and young, I think probably Ruanthi again, India, Ranila, you will know that. So there are no poor people there anymore. So the, the purpose of the trust, the object of the trust is exhausted. So one of the ground bases on which uh, this uh, extinction of trust, that's that section, uh, extinction of trust is section 79. If you look at 79, it says, a trust is extinguished <clears throat> when its purpose is completely fulfilled. That is, you can't um, fulfill it anymore because the purpose is fulfilled. When its purpose becomes unlawful, you can't. So in that way, you can't carry on with the trust. Subject to powers of the court, or when the trust being revocable is expressly revoked. So 85 is that. So that there is the purpose of the trust has come to an end, or the beneficiary is identified by a particular description that ceased to be of that description. The poor become very rich now. Then the, there is balance in the hand. Of the trustee, they can't pocket it. They're still holding it for the benefit of the object of the trust in the absence of a beneficiary. So it says, <clears throat> so much thereof as is unexhausted, you will return it to the owner. If it did, it goes to the representative. So he holds the funds in a fiduciary capital, like, a, like an executor of a will or things like that. The man is dead. Donor is, uh, the, the settler is dead. Uh, then the trustee still holds it because he is Holding it impressed with the obligation to hold it for somebody else, that somebody else is gone. So, some all have perished in the tsunami. So, in some cases, what we do is we make an application to court to do the sea prey doctrine. It's a beautiful doctrine. I don't know whether you have studied these things. Sea prey means as far as, as, as far as it goes. So, the court will, will go there, my lord, whatever you call them these days. Um, this is the intention. These guys are not there. Shall we divert it to the poor people of um, Hambantote? Are there poor people in Hambantote anymore? You know, I don't know. Or something like that. Or shall we send it to the people in the Vanni or the people? people? So that is to, uh, so thereby, it's an interesting concept. Sipre is not mentioned here. Thereby, you try to achieve the intention of the settler of the trust that the funds he gave to somebody else be intended to be used for that purpose as far as it goes. That's ABC is not there, B, C, and C, you qualify there, but not in Eastern. So that is how, so with the obligation, obligation, if it says 85, it will hold for the benefit of the author of the trust, if I am alive, 
or legal representative on, upon his death. So you are dealing with human trust um, or set laws and authors of the trust. That's how it works. Because it says the examples given below basically means that, but section itself is that. Would that answer your question? I don't know. Thank you so much, sir. That was very clear. Uh, then we have another question. Um, perhaps, uh, Ruandi, you might be able to uh, take this. Can we incorporate a company as a trust where the directors of the trust company to be the beneficiaries of the trust? Sorry, it's, it's, my connection was unstable. Uh, well, in that situation, um, the shareholders would be the owners of the assets of the company. So when you say, can we incorporate the company as a trust, um, where the directors are the trust company are the beneficiaries. So is this a situation where the beneficiaries are also beneficiaries, where the directors are also shareholders? Um, that's, the, that's the question. The, the idea is whether basically whether they can benefit from the, from the trust, although in, in, it's put into a company form. Well, you know, if you look at the, if I can just, but uh, Ruanti, just see, I don't know how you are, whether you have done anything rather. Well, it's simply this a body corporate can be a trustee. Now, under the Inland Revenue Act, he speaks of entities, but we say a body corporate is a person. So, so the, the, in, the corporation must have been um, incorporated for the purpose of execution of a trust. We are a trustee company, then the directors are the human face of the management of the company. So the company doesn't talk, company doesn't speak. So the, I would argue, I would say the board of directors are obliged to carry out the objects for which the company has been formed. The business of the company is a trust company. And if the article will explain uh, what exactly has to do, so the object will be to carry, to carry on the functions of a trustees of the trust. Trust company depends on the nature of the company, what are the articles and things like that. So their obligation will be to carry out the functions that the company is entitled to under section 184. Is they will be in charge of the management of the company. So if they are in that position, then obviously they cannot be the beneficiary. They are share option scheme and all that. Trust form companies and the employees are there. So they may be, you know. So I don't think they can be. Directors of a trust company can be beneficiaries also of the trust company. Pranti, I don't know, have you come across any such? Uh, I, I haven't. No, sir, because in this situation, then the directors would also be the shareholders in order to be beneficiaries of the trust property. But like you said, in this situation, they have taken on the trust in their independent capacity as, I mean, management of the company will be through the directors, but um, them administering the trust in the capacity of trustees is because they have taken it on as an assignment, not so much I, as trustees. I don't know if, if I give my property to a trust company to execute a trust, you know, the, if the property belongs to the company. Shareholders' ownership is only with regard to their shares. And the rest. so the property is of the company and not of the shareholder, though they are called owners of a company, but it means that the share ownership is the company. Any, in, any, any ownership passed to the company remains the tight. The company remains the um, title holder of the, the, the separate distinction between the company property as against the shareholder. That's the ownership of the company is different to the ownership of a property which belongs to the company. So here, if it's I want to say I trust I'm I'm a company I'll manage these trustees and trusts in like that. So the trustees I give you hundred million bucks to manage. You see, so which means either they have no they, under in the classical concept of the trust, they are holding it. They have to be the title to it, legal title to that money, and they must do it for somebody else's benefit. So if the, even if it's a, it becomes company property, it's held by the company as a trustee, it is a trustee, 
as for the benefit of somebody else, not for them. So I don't know whether the company is creating its own trust out of its own funds. That's another issue. I don't know what is. But if a third party is requesting a trustee company within the concept of a trustee as a body corporate, then the question is, it being given a property, the ownership of the property, where the legal title vests with the company, company, not the shareholder, and the company is told do this. So the, what the company is told do it this way is done by the management. Under 184, they are the ones who operate the management. So they'll have to then utilize those funds, which now becomes theirs by reason of the creation of a trust for the benefit of some other person, not for themselves. That's how I see it. So ownership of a company only means the other, the members of the company own the company, but the company owns its own property. That's the fundamental distinction that uh, very often confused. Because own the company, I don't own the property of the company. Company owns it because it's a separate legal person with the right to hold property. But the management of the property is with the trustee, not the shareholder. Shareholders, the return is only to get their dividends and things like that, any right that attach their shares. In that way, they contribute shares to the company's uh, running, and therefore they can be said to be owners of the company. But uh, company owning its own property doesn't become the shareholder's uh, property, you know. So, you, so it has to be it has to be worked out what exactly when it meant by a trustee company, what is it doing? You know, simply we say, you know, you understand. That's why I see it. Hello, who asked the question? Are you happy with it or anything? Anyway. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I believe uh, we have come to the end of um, our session because we are a little over time. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our panelists for, their, for sharing their knowledge. Um, I would also like to thank the Bar Association of Sri Lanka for giving this opportunity for all of us to learn and share uh, basically from the comfort of our own home. So thank you, and back to you, uh, Abhirami. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ranila, for assisting us in today's webinar. And I guess we have to wrap up today's webinar. I hope all the participants gain a whole lot of insight. I'm glad we had many participants joining in and interacting with questions. And I also wish to thank our panel of speakers, Dr. Kanaganayagam Kanakiswaran, President's Council, Mr. Suresh R.I. Pereira, Ms. Ruanti Tantrike. We really appreciate you taking time off your busy schedule on a Saturday evening and making a valuable contribution to today's discussion. I would also like to thank the management committee and the seminars committee and all those who helped in numerous ways to make this webinar fruitful. Thank you all for joining. Have a pleasant evening. Stay safe. Good night. Thank you. Stay safe yourself. Thank you. Good night. Hello.